Hello, hello, and a very warm welcome to this first webinar out of six on a brand new topic, which is climate ad adaption solution from different corners of the world. My name is Rudy van Beurde, and it's my pleasure to be your host again, as I was hosting a series on Dutch topics last year as well. And all of those you can find back at platform w-o-w-dot-n-l and this time we take it a little bit broader as we will seek for international solutions and maybe ideas and inspirations and the setup how it's going to be is that we have a full hour between today's nine and ten but sometimes it will be varying in the times as due to uh, different time zones we have to uh, shift every here and there and I will explain you shortly how you can interact with us because we will have two speakers um, willing to share their expertise in some short presentations, but very much we would like you to participate and I will just pop up the screen real quick in order for you to see how you can interact with us. Um, maybe a good thing to know is that uh, it's being recorded and afterwards maybe you got so inspired that you want to see things back. That's all possible through the website that you now see in screen. And it's also good to know that your name, the chat, and all questions asked won't be visible then. So if you want to interact, please find the button of the Q&A. With that, you can actually have on-topic questions for the keynote speakers that I will introduce anytime shortly. And if you see an existing question, you'll, you'll also be able to upvote it. Maybe you experience some technical issues and then there's the button of the chat, which is the regular chat button. And my colleague behind the scenes will be able to help you. Sometimes it helps to step out of the call, out of the webinar and then join it back again in order to uh, reinstall everything. But that will be just all good. Please uh, take your notepads out and your pens because uh, from now, I will introduce the speakers real shortly. We will have um, two expertise, um, two expertise is covered. The first speaker will take us internationally and more specifically to the content of Africa. And afterwards, we will focus on some solutions in the Dutch context. Please, can we get your cameras activated? Joop Verhagen and Hans de Moel, please join us. There you are, we see you in screen, excellent. Um, you, starting with you, you are working for the Global Center of Adaptation and you're the program lead on water and urban. And before you take it away entirely, what is the Global Center, and Center of Adaption about? What's the purpose? Um, yeah, thank you, Rudy. A, a short introduction. We all talk about mitigation, how we stop climate change. But we started realizing, or people started realizing that the climate will change. It will mm -hmm. change very drastically. And that's why the Global Center for Adaptation was established by a commission that was headed by Ban Ki-moon, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, and Bill mm -hmm. Gates. Okay, all right. So they, they were the founding fathers, uh, yep. to put it that way, excellent. And for that, you have over 25 years of experience in an international context as well. So very well traveled and you will, uh, you will share your insights later on in your presentation. Thank you very much. But also we have Hans de Moel coming to us from Amsterdam, from the Vrije Universiteit. How do you translate this? Is it the free university or how, how is it in international context, Hans? I can, I can tell you that has changed through time. It, it used to be free university, then VU University, now we're Vrije Universiteit. As long as it's not University of Amsterdam, because then the credit goes to the other university. That's the second uh, university in Amsterdam as well. And Hans Moel, you're, you're an assistant professor and you're with the Institute of Environmental Science. And you have a lot of expertise in the field of water and climate risks, like floods and droughts, etc. Can you tell us a little bit about your work before you uh, start course, the yeah. presentation? Yeah, so the, uh, I've been working at the Institute for Environmental Studies, I think, since 2003. It's the uh, oldest uh, environmental studies institute in the Netherlands. 
Um, uh, and I've been, uh, I started out working on, on flood risk and branched out into, uh, into more risks, including hail and drought and storms and things like that. Um, but later on today, I will go back to my, uh, to my roots and, and talk a bit about uh, uh, flood risk management in the context of climate change adaptation. Excellent, excellent. All right, Hans, we will see you in about 15 minutes time as you will uh, take it away as, as the first one of the speakers. Yet and again, a warm invite to all of you attending. Please use the Q&A button in order to ask questions. And after the both of the presentations, we will be covering them in an open block. So Hans and you will be able to respond live to them and everything will be recorded so you can always view it back. Um, Hans, I kindly ask you to mute yourself again and then you maybe once more share your slides because they were in screen, but now they yeah. walked away. Here we go. Um, I, I gave you a big round of applause. Applause by one, Joep um, Verhagen. There you go. Take it away. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Rudy. Let me just continue a bit of background on, on the Global Center on Adaptation. As I mentioned, we were set up as a response to give more attention to climate adaptation because the world is changing. We know that. And we do three things. And that's the three combined things makes us as GCA a unique organization. We, we set and try to set the agenda. So we are active at the political level as much as we can. Um, so we participate in the COP, but we also participate in the in the World Bank meetings. We organize meetings with African leaders. We are active on the creation of knowledge um, around climate adaptation because it's still a field where a lot needs to be learned. And we are busy working on programs, actually making sure that we affect change on the ground. We don't want to be a big organization. We call ourselves a solutions broker. That means that we take solutions and try to make them fit to different situations. My presentation today will mostly focus on the knowledge, the state and trends report on adaptation in Africa. And I'll give you an example of our programs and action on the ground in Africa in cities. Very quickly, a final on the left hand side, our office, the floating office where I'm right now in Rotterdam, an example of climate adaptation. And at the moment, we have regional offices in Dhaka, Beijing, and Abidjan, and I'm sitting in Rotterdam at the moment. So one of the things we started doing is to produce a state and trends report on adaptation, this time in Africa for 2022. And I'll give you a small sample of the findings which I thought were particularly striking and illustrative on what climate change will do in Africa. Keep in mind, Africa is responsible for 5% of the total historical uh, CO2 emissions, only 5%, and still the hit hardest as a continent by the impact of climate change. So how does, how does that look like? So what, what, are, what are the impacts? One is, of course, we know we're living in a world that's getting warmer. Historically, we've seen that with across the continent, temperatures are rising by 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 degrees per decade. And what we can see that under all the scenarios we looked at, by mid-century 2050, Africa on average will be 1.5 degrees warmer. Now, what does that mean? That means that the number of days, that means, for instance, the number of days that are really, really hot to start with, let's say above 35 degrees, will increase from 20 to 160 days. Um, and that we even see that in certain parts of, of, the, of the continent, the, there are going to be a lot of days above 40 degrees. Now, if it's a dry heat, because I'm just back from Chad, if it's a dry heat, it's still okay. You can tolerate 42 degrees in a dry heat as long as you don't have to work or run or whatever. But if you live in a humid environment and temperatures go above 40 degrees, you hit a point where a human body can't sustain itself if you're not in, a, in an air-conditioned environment. So it, it, it has a big impact. Secondly, what we see, of course, like, um, rising temperatures will have an impact on 
on droughts and floods on precipitation patterns. Overall, we think, and that's what IPCC says, like we don't see large changes in the overall um, uh, precipitation. Um, but what we do see, the extreme weather events will be more severe and will be more frequent. So for instance, what used to be a one in 100 year flood will be a one in 40 year flood if we stick to a 1.5 degree scenario, but it will be even become a one in 20 year flood on the an, a higher temp, on the temp scenarios that, that go for three degrees global warming. So what you see is that we have more floods, we have more droughts, though we ex IPCC expects that the overall rainfall, the total rainfall will not drastically change. Now, what is the impact of that on, um, on one of the sectors that uses most of the, of the water? Agriculture. Agriculture in Africa uses 81% of the total water that's being used in the continent. Almost all the <clears throat> current, currently, almost all the agriculture is rain fat. So that means that if there are more droughts, we estimate that 1.1 billion people will be at a risk because there will be less food, the livelihoods will not be sustainable, um, which is a huge impact. So though we see overall rainfall, the um, total rainfall will not change drastically, we expect that because of the character of the, of the agriculture in Africa, there will be 1.1 billion people at risk due to water constraints. Now, as I said, like most of the of the of the agriculture is rain fed, only three percent is irrigated, and we think what we see in the continent across Africa that it would be fairly easy, but it would be doable to expand irrigation infrastructure not to cover seven point seven million hectares, but move up to thirteen eight million hectares of irrigated uh, agricultural land. Irrigation is, of course, not the solution because things can, things do go wrong, water gets wasted, but by increasing the amount of land that's being irrigated, we start building more climate resilience. Now, basically, if we go for the three degree uh, scenario, we think there will be absolutely catastrophic impacts on the African food system in the next 30 years. 1.5 degrees still kind of provides a clear way out to adapt to a different climate, but a three degree scenario actually will put, will make sure, will mean for the number of places across the continent that you can't adapt anymore. And that has huge impacts on the population, on economic growth, and on welfare and well-being in, in the continent. We think, um, yeah, so basically, again, clear what means, what does it mean if temperature, global temperatures rise by three degrees on average, the income of the poorest 40% will decrease by 8% in 2030. That's eight years from now. Um, by 2050, 70, 70 million people, additional people will be undernourished. And undernourishment means that children don't go to school, that children don't perform well at school. And there's a lot of research that shows that if you are born in a drought, you will carry these impacts for the rest of your life. Um, if you then try to translate it into what would it cost to adapt? And what are the costs of non-action? Um, we calculated on the basis of various studies that if you want to adapt the agriculture sector to a different climate, the cost will be around $15 billion annually, about 1% of the regional GDP. The cost of inaction are likely to be around $200 million. That's 12% of GDP. So there is a huge economic case to be made to invest in climate adaptation, especially in the water sector. In the water sector for agriculture, I highlighted the numbers. What would it cost 
to improve water management around six million, six billion dollars. What are the cost of inaction? The cost of inaction are 15 times higher. So having said that, so what as GCA, what we have started doing, we've launched the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. And this is a program that we developed in close coordination with our partner, the African Development Bank. And the vision is to actually leverage by 2025, $25 billion of investments in climate resilient infrastructure. Now the number is huge, but the, for, the philosophy behind it is that we think that everyone and every decision made on investments in infrastructure that can be hard and soft infrastructure should be done considering the risks of climate, should be done considering a changing climate. So we need to prepare, start preparing for a world for tomorrow, which is gonna be very different from the world of today where we all live. Um, very quickly, it's a program also that is not just developed with AFTB, but we also had large and very significant consultations with African heads of states to make sure that this is something the continent and the countries and the people in Africa feel comfortable with. We have four pillars within this uh, program. One is on food security, one is on infrastructure, one is on creation job, and the other one is on innovation financial initiatives. My work mostly focuses on what we call AIRA, the Africa Infrastructure Resilience Accelerator. And I'll finalize my presentation by giving you a bit of a sample, a bit of an idea how this looks like and how this works. Um, what we created is something we call the City Adaptation Accelerator. And we work very closely with AFTB, the African Development Bank, with World Bank and cities to do four things. One is make sure that there is a better and more localized understanding of what climate change means locally. And what you see is that because of the paucity of data, that understanding can be strengthened and improved. Secondly, we support cities and we support uh, investors strategizing, prioritizing and planning for climate adaptation. We want to make sure that these are not plans on a bookshelf. That's why we very closely always link with, um, <clears throat> with financial institutions, be it the multilateral development banks, but also with private investors. And the final thing that we work on is actually strengthening the local of the strengthening the institutional capacity. Now, how does that, that's my final slide. How does that look like? As I said, I'm just returned from Chad, Jemena, the capital of, of Chad. Um, Jemena is a, is, a, is a city with about 1.5 million inhabitants. It's in the Sahel on the border of the Sahara. It's hot. When I was there, it was 43 degrees. And it's mostly dry. But surprisingly, and also to my surprise, the city gets flooded twice a year. One in the rainy season between August, September, when there's a lot of rainfall, the absorption capacity of the soil is very, very limited. There's no infrastructure to, to drain away the rain. And the land is very flat, so it, the water stays. And then later on in November, the city gets flooded the second time because of the river, the two rivers that run through the city. So we worked, we worked with the World Bank, uh, who are investing $150 million to mitigate flood risks in the city, to see what can we do to better prepare for climate change. And what, we, what we're doing, we are looking at how women are more vulnerable to climate change and the impact of floods, because we know that there's a big disparity between what men and what women experience. We help them to look at the impacts of flood, not just on assets, but also have a look at the impacts of floods on services and on, um, on people. You can imagine if you have a city with five bridges, for instance, 
if one bridge gets flooded, that is not, it's, it's difficult, but it's not the end of the world. If that city has one bridge, like Jemena, and that bridge is inaccessible during floods, it has a huge impact on people. It means that people can't travel from one end to the city. They may not be able to travel to their, to their job. And in case there is medical services only available on one side of the river, people can't visit the hospital. So we, we look at the impacts of floods from that lens. And on that basis, we try to help um, prioritize investments. And finally, we develop because we think it's important that local communities are part of this program. We develop with the World Bank a strategy to involve local communities. Now, what did we do during our first visit? We basically said, let's put down a number of principles that we think will help you, will help the city to do the right thing. And partly they may sound very Dutch, so maybe Hans comes with, with a similar, like with some similar ideas or principles. Um, we need to adopt a systems approach. Before we start investing, we need to understand um, the entire city and the flood risks and flood models much better. We've seen that now current solutions actually solve a problem in one place and create a problem elsewhere. Um, we need to get going very quickly. So we need to invest and identify a number of no regret solutions. We have to combine green and gray solutions and we have to act just like the Netherlands moves in a situation that you tell people we can control floods and we make sure floods will never happen to a situation where people are living with floods, right? The same as what happened in the Netherlands. And importantly, we need to look into the future because climate is not the only thing that's changing in, in Jemena. The city is growing by 5% per, per year, which is a lot. The economy is changing, the demographics are changing, so we really need to plan for the future. I'll leave it there. I'll be really happy to answer any of the questions that you have later on. Thank you. Excellent, Joop. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this overview. Um, it's quite a grim story and it's involving big, big numbers, obviously, and you're uh, suggesting a systems approach. Um, there's a lot of it going on and what you said before, maybe it was also in the preparation that Africa is being hit very hard by climate change, even though they didn't contribute to the emission of all these gases like Western countries did. And uh, you also brought a poll along. Shall we just open it up and see what people think of it? Because you were asking in the poll, the Netherlands should contribute to Africa's climate adaption. What is your opinion? So now in your screen, if you are viewing this webinar, there should be the option to answer either one of the multiple choice options. What was the number again, um, Joop? That they only emitted like 5%? 5% of the historical total. Yeah. But and they are they're hit hardest by the impacts of climate change more mm -hmm. than any other continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now the poll question is, so it's open. The Netherlands should contribute to Africa's climate adaption. Do you think very sure? Yes, maybe up to that 5%. No, it's up to them. Or, well, I don't know, or maybe I don't have an opinion. Um, well, here you see the outcomes. Is it also visible for you, Joop? Yeah. What, what do you think of these outcomes? I'm very happy to read that most people think we should support. And I think that's, um, it's of course a hot political debate, yeah. Um, who should contribute and who should carry the, the damage and losses, but I'm happy to read the outcome. Excellent, excellent. Joop, there will be plenty of time afterwards for some additional questions. So the Q and A is being activated. That's very nice. We will get to that in a bit. Please use it also during the presentation of Hans. Thank you so much, Joop. Hans, may I kindly ask you to join the stage? You will also have a poll question, but it will be later in your presentation, if I'm correct. Correct. It's, it's all yours, all the way from the Vrije Universiteit. Hans de Moel, uh, it's all yours. There you go. Yes. 
Let me see if this is working. So hopefully you see my screen at the moment. Definitely. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Then uh, let's kick off. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to address you all. Uh, from expertise as mentioned, um, I've been working a lot on, uh, on, on flood risks uh, for my, uh, back from my PhD uh, in the uh, you know, early 2000s, more or less. Um, and I wanted to share with you some of the, uh, the, the things I learned about uh, climate change adaptation, specifically related to flood risk. Um, I'll give you some examples from, to be fair, from uh, places all over the world, but I'll, I'll zoom in a bit more at the end on, on the Netherlands and the US, USA, because that's where some of my research has, has focused on as well. Um, but before going into uh, some of those examples, um, uh, let me start by setting the stage a bit with uh, how we talk about risk and, and, and flood risks and disaster risk. And what we usually do is we, uh, we, we split it up in three different components. And those components are uh, hazard exposure and vulnerability, where the hazard of a risk is the, uh, the actual event itself that can be uh, the, the flood event itself. Uh, it's the water which is coming down the river. It can also be the drought itself. It can also be the earthquake or, or a hailstorm or whatever. But that's the natural phenomenon itself. Um, but the natural phenomenon itself, uh, a, uh, um, a, a flood somewhere in a, in a polar desert doesn't really you know, pose any risk. And that's because there's no exposure, there's no, there's no people, there's no assets uh, there. Um, 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 uh, so that's the second component of risk. Uh, and those exposed elements, uh, people, assets, buildings, uh, communities, and so forth, uh, they also have a, a, a certain characteristic, characteristic, a certain vulnerability on you know, how easily they get damaged, yes or no, uh, which is the third component of risk. And basically, if we want to reduce risk, we can reduce risk by reducing any of those three components. Right? We can reduce the, the hazard, we can reduce, try to reduce the exposure, try to reduce the vulnerability, right? and in all different ways, we can reduce the overall risk of a, of a certain disaster. Now, if we look at the Netherlands, then uh, one of the risk frameworks which has been introduced, uh, um, I think about 10, 15 years ago, uh, was called the multi-layer safety um, uh, approach, uh, which you can see a, a figure here. Uh, where the, uh, the philosophy is that uh, we can reduce flood risk by prevention, uh, by building dikes, which you can see here in, uh, on the bottom, or we can reduce it by uh, adjusting our spatial planning, which you can see here in the middle, or we can reduce it by improving our emergency management and evacuation, as you can see in the top. Um, and if you think back to the three components I was just talking about, it's basically that the bottom component is influencing the hazards, uh, the spatial planning component is influencing the exposure and the emergency management component is basically the vulnerability uh, part of it. And so you can see those components coming back in those and the philosophy of how to how to manage flood disasters and, and adapt um, uh, to flooding. Um, but this is already quite specific spatial planning emergency management. If you take a little bit of a step back, um, uh, then in the uh, international international literature uh, we have what we call the disaster management cycle. Um, um, and that um, shows four over here, five different phases um, in which all of those phases we can take action to reduce risk of an, of an overall uh, uh, um, uh, peril. Um, and uh, those different phases are also linked to those hazard exposure and vulnerability components I was talking about earlier. Um, the first phase is usually is the, is the prevention. That's basically preventing a disaster from happening, which usually mainly targets the hazard itself. So yeah, if there's no hazard, uh, we have no problem, right? Um, the second component is here called mitigation. And here mitigation is, is a different interpretation than the mitigation of CO2 gas emissions. Here mitigation is a reduction not in CO2, but a reduction of the impact a, 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 a flood or a, a, a different a disaster would have. And that can be done either by reducing exposure or vulnerability. Uh, and then if we get closer to an actual event, there's the preparation phase of the disaster management cycle where we uh, try to prepare for, for, for what's coming. And then if there's, an, uh, if there's a disaster, there's an impact, then there's of course, of course the immediate response, um, uh, the emergency management um, on the ground uh, when there is a disaster striking. And after disaster, there's then the recovery phase, trying to you know, get back on track after the impact of a, of a disaster like a flood. So what I want to do now is I, I want to give you some examples of measures which we can take in the context of flood risk uh, from all these different, or from all these five components of the disaster management cycle. Um, starting out with prevention, 
Um, prevention is something which is very intuitive, right? Uh, when we talk about flooding, we talk about dikes and you can build a dike yourself around your own house, uh, as has been done here in the, in the United States, in the Mississippi uh, area. Um, you can also do it in a more communal way as we are used to in the Netherlands. Here you can see uh, a section of the um, um, uh, West Friese Omring Dijk, uh, so in, uh, in North Holland, um, of a couple of years ago, uh, which was one, I think, one of the first dike rings in the area, but I'm sure there's people from waterboards who know this even better than me. Um, uh, you can also incorporate, uh, besides, let's say, traditional levees, you can also incorporate the built fabric uh, in, your, in your prevention. Here you can see an example from Kampen in the bottom right. Uh, where actually the buildings themselves, and they need to close the streets in between, function as a water barrier for, for water from the IJssel River. Um, uh, uh, or this example, bottom left from, uh, from Japan, uh, one of the uh, bit of a dangers with a, with a dike or a levee is that, you know, if there's, you know, high water levels, uh, there's the, there are some failure mechanisms which, uh, uh, which could, uh, you know, cause breaches, which of course we don't want. And the solution which they tried out in Japan is to just build a levee which is 100 meters wide. Um, so we're pretty sure it's not going to break and we can actually build uh, then, you know, houses on top of that with nice view over the water, uh, which they call, I think, a super levee is the, is the term they, they use for that. Uh, so uh, levees come in all kinds of different shapes and, and forms. A different way of prevention is to make sure that the water level doesn't reach as high. In the Netherlands, we have the room for the river program. Here's some illustrations for that. Uh, the idea is that uh, if you, if you with levees, you narrow the path of the river, uh, then water levels actually, because you've got the same volume of water, actually goes up quite fast. Uh, but by giving big back space to the to the river, we make sure that water levels are uh, are lower, um, and fr from that we reduce the probabilities of flooding and of dike breaches as well. That can be done by you know literally putting a, a dike back or by building a, a bypass, uh, as you can see in the, in the top left, um, which I visited last week in Comp actually because I hadn't seen it yet, um, um, uh, and and various other uh, other solutions there. Um, um, last example for prevention um, is something which in the Netherlands we did a, not on purpose, but a, a bit by accident. That's what we call compartmentalization, um, where uh, like the Titanic, or at least the philosophy of the Titanic, because obviously that didn't work, uh, is that um, uh, if we have our big dike rings in the Netherlands, uh, which are basically sort of big bathtubs, uh, if we, if we you know, put levees in between, um, uh, then we can make sure only a small part gets flooded when we have a breach in the dike. Um, uh, so not the entire area gets flooded. So we, uh, we, uh, uh, we focus it on, on just a small part. The downside there is that for the people living in that, that smaller part, it's actually more dangerous because water levels will increase uh, uh, more rapidly. Uh, so there's some pros and cons, uh, but in the Netherlands, we have a, a long history of levees and some of those older levees um, uh, actually uh, uh, function uh, um, not by design, but just by being there, uh, function as a sort of compartmentalization. No. So those are all kinds of ways to, to think about prevention. If you go to mitigation, as mentioned, that's reducing the impact of a flood. Um, then you can think about, um, if you want to, uh, for instance, uh, target exposure, you can think about uh, these types of flood maps, uh, which can be used in spatial planning to make sure that new buildings are not built in the most dangerous zones. Uh, like the red zones here, or that there are some zones where, uh, which is medium dangerous, um, where you can build, but maybe in a flood adapted way, um, uh, or some zones where it's, uh, where it's okay to build. That's uh, so a way you give some guidance on, on where we put our new developments and our, and our exposure to flooding. Um, I already mentioned uh, uh, flood proofing a bit. Um, there is a lot that can be done at the, uh, at the asset or the building level. Here's a couple of examples of two terms which we call wet proofing and dry proofing. Um, both flood proofing measures, where with wet proofing, we make sure that you know, the flood can happen, enters the building or the assets, uh, but the damage will be, will be, will be low. Uh, famous examples are, make sure you have a, a tile floor instead of a very expensive wooden floor that will, that will make sure that your, your damage will be lower. Um, the other flood proofing, which is here, which is on the right, uh, we call dry proofing is basically where you make your house watertight, waterproof that water doesn't actually enter your house um, and uh, reduce damage uh, as, a, as a result as well. Uh, and um, furthermore, we can, of course, uh, we also experiment in the Netherlands a bit with, uh, with floating houses. 
um, uh, I think this is Eiberg, if I'm correct. Uh, hey, we, we know our, our own boat, our living boats um, uh, uh, quite well, uh, but also more, let's say, substantial houses uh, uh, have, been, have been built as well, uh, but not in a very large degree. Uh, Eiberg has a, has, a, uh, has a very nice example, but we don't see it in many areas uh, around. Um, then next into the preparation phase, there's a lot of things you can do when it comes to preparation. It has to do with informing your citizens, uh, working for awareness. Uh, this is a uh, Nederland Leef met Water was a uh, was a campaign which I still remember when I was a bit younger. Um, but here on the right, you also see uh, a leaflet which was distributed in the UK. Um, has, so people have a checklist of uh, of what to do. And there's been many websites developed these days, uh, also in the Netherlands, where you can check your own flood risk. Uh, uh, and you can see uh, actions you can take. Uh, you can take accordingly. That, that all has to do with you know preparing uh, uh, us as citizens for a eventual disaster. Basically, um, there's also things you can do at a more uh, a bit of a larger scale, uh, which has to do with uh, forecasting. Of course, uh, in the Netherlands we have a, a, a big forecasting system also for the for the, the Meuse and the, and the Rhine. Here you see an example of the of a global flood forecasting system. Uh, with an, uh, an example from, uh, from Africa. And organizations like the Red Cross uh, use these forecasts to, uh, to prepare and move assets. If there's a forecast that there could be flooding in a certain region, they can, they can move assets to that region uh, that when a disaster would strike, that they can, uh, they can act quickly. Um, and if it doesn't strike, then, um, uh, well, then of course you have a, you have a bit of a loss, uh, but uh, various research has shown that this forecast-based action um, if you if you compare the uh, the benefits of you know when you have been prepared uh, against losses when there was a false alarm that it's uh, it's a very uh, efficient way to uh, to do this. Uh, but for this we need proper forecasting. Then if a, if a, if an event hits if a flood hits then we come into the response phase of the disaster management cycle, uh, and then of course we talk about evacuation evacuation routes which can be uh, set up. Uh, here's an example from somewhere in the United States. To be fair, I don't know exactly uh, where this was. Uh, but what I always find very interesting is to see that uh, the big highways they have, uh, they, they have a system where they actually move the traffic around, that all the highways, which usually go in and out of the city, now are both are used to get to get out of the city. Uh, but you need to think about that because that's quite a you know, logistical, uh, logistical process. Um, uh, so if you haven't prepared for that, then uh, that, that response becomes more difficult as well. Um, think also about shelters. Here is a hurricane shelter in uh, in Bangladesh. So you know when people evacuate, they've got a, a place to go as well where they uh, where they are safe. Um, think about uh, temporary flood barriers. Here are an example from the Elbe flood in Germany, 2013, uh, where they put up um, mobile flood barriers um, during a flood event there. Um, we've seen in many places, also in the Netherlands, uh, uh, last summer. Uh, that uh, uh, with with sandbags and a lot of people, a lot of help from the community, um, uh, we can leverage that to uh, to set up so I set up uh, protection, temporary protection as well. Um, or you could even try to uh, if you have a beach in the dike, try to put a, a barge or a ship into it to try and plug it. Um, I think this example in the Alba actually uh, failed unfortunately, um, but there is a uh, there's a story about the 1950s in the Netherlands uh, uh, where it did work for a bit. And then um, after the response phase, we get to the uh, recovery phase, which is everything to do with you know, getting back to normal. It has to do with compensation. It has to do with insurance. Um, here's a couple of uh, uh, sites um, or articles related to the floods in the south of the Netherlands in Limburg last summer, uh, where there was uh, insurance um, uh, for uh, things like the, the Geul, people in Falkenburg. Um, um, but the people along the Meuse River, uh, they're usually, uh, their insurance doesn't cover their flooding. And then the, uh, the government steps in with compensation. But there was also a couple of people who fell in between. Um, uh, so it's, uh, that's also something which can be you know, managed to reduce the impact for people uh, overall. Especially for businesses, it's important to quickly have access to those funds to, to, to get back into business before going bankrupt, basically. Um, um, in, the, in the United States, you also have, a, for instance, a, a big national flood insurance program where, unlike the Netherlands, uh, you know, flooding on a large scale is, uh, is used. And there it's also used as an incentive, which is, uh, which is quite interesting, uh, where uh, uh, if you take measures to uh, flood proof your home, for instance, you actually get a reduction in your, in your flood insurance premium, which, may, uh, which means that there is an incentive 
to reduce the uh, the vulnerability of your of your building, and as a, as a result, uh, reduce the overall uh, overall risk. That's a, it's it's something which has worked a lot in the uh, in, in in fire insurance and and fire risks overall. Um, uh, and in the states, uh, they also try to do that related to uh, to flooding. Now, I've given you uh, given you a lot of examples about uh, um, um, adaptation measures you can take in different parts of the disaster management cycle. Um, so now I wanted to open a, a poll question to you. Um, if you think about the Netherlands and you think about the USA, on which components do you think in the disaster management cycle, do you think the focus is in the, in the national flood management um, uh, of these two countries, of the Netherlands and the USA? So of these five components, um, you can pick multiple components if you want. Where do you think the focus is um, in the Netherlands and where do you think the focus is in the USA? And then after this poll, uh, we'll take a look at the results, obviously, um, but I have some slides to, to share you, you know, my opinion on that as well. I can see that in the poll, I'm actually not allowed to vote myself. I'm very sad about that. So I'm hoping all of you do. There's a message of my uh, technical colleague. If there's no poll on your screen, you can find it in your screen in the top right or maybe below. So then you might have to press a button and then it pops up and then you're able to vote as well. Excellent. So hopefully people can find it. Let's take a look at the results. So first off, the Netherlands, I, I see a nice trend down. So prevention by far the most votes, 80% plus. Uh, then mitigation, preparation, response, recovery. Have, have basically, are, uh, uh, the uh, the way we see this is that the further you go in this disaster management cycle, the less we do about this. Uh, all right, very clear, very clear. Thank you. And then if we go to the USA, um, uh, we see that uh, preparation, response, and a bit recovery um, uh, are the are the top three, and much less on on, on prevention and mitigation. Only six percent on six percent on prevention. Um, this is actually very much in line with with my own thoughts. So. Let me um, let me bring you to uh, some slides on that. First, on the on, on the Netherlands. Um, so um, yeah, in the Netherlands, we are known for prevention. Eighty percent had that uh, of you had that in the poll as well um, as the most important part uh, of our flood management. Right? We have the levees along the along the rivers. We have our storm surge barriers, the delta works, uh, and we have super high safety standards. Um, uh, they've been changed a couple of years ago. I think back in twenty eighteen. So yes, I, I would agree with you that prevention um, is a big focus in the Netherlands. Doesn't mean we don't do anything in the other parts, right? Um, um, but comparatively, it is, uh, uh, it, it's a lot less. And that is, of course, everything to do with you know, the characteristics of the Netherlands. Uh, you can see a nice picture of areas which are below sea level um, or are outside or are still in dike rings or are potentially flooded. That's about you know, half of the, of the country uh, can be affected by flooding, maybe even 55%. And without levees, we can't even, you know, work there, uh, uh, live here in the first place. Um, we do have some areas which are not embanked, which you see, can see here in, uh, uh, in, in brown. Uh, and there, things like mitigation become more interesting, right? Um, so we do some things there, but not too much. Now, if we go to the USA, um, I already gave some examples uh, earlier, right? At the National Flood Insurance Program, um, uh, they have those homeowners guides to retrofitting. So uh, there's a lot more flood, uh, uh, flood proofing, which is done there, uh, uh, incentivized by this uh, flood insurance program. I gave the example of evacuation, uh, of which they have a lot of experience there. Um, and they also, I very much like the, uh, or I like, it's, it's very typical the way they approach it. They call it also flood fighting, right? The military comes involved, there's a disaster. Um, uh, so the emergency response, they have a lot of experience with, uh, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They are also experienced many more floods than we do in the Netherlands. So uh, that experience makes sense. Um, so yeah, I would indeed say 
that they uh, base it much more on, on different parts. They obviously they have prevention in places as well, but they do a lot more when it comes to response, uh, uh, recovery preparation, um, also a bit of mitigation, which is related to the recovery as, uh, as mentioned. And that is everything to do with the characteristics of the United States, right? It's a huge country, much larger than the Netherlands. So the Netherlands is relatively small, so it's easier and cheaper to build embankments everywhere. If you want to build embankments everywhere in the United States, as in the Netherlands, it's, uh, it's going to be way too expensive. Um, but also the types of floods they have and the types of weather they have. Uh, there's these tropical cyclones or hurricanes, which we don't have in the Netherlands. Um, uh, which are much more, uh, much stronger and much more difficult to uh, to protect against and prevent against. Uh, so it also makes sense that that they have uh, uh, that they focus on different parts of the disaster management cycle. So then to uh, to wrap up, uh, reducing risk and uh, adapting to uh, to those disasters, uh, which unfortunately, uh, as as you already mentioned, will increase in the future. That can be done by reducing not only the hazard, but also exposure or vulnerability can be done in, uh, in, in various ways, as I uh, showed, um, can be structural, non-structural. Some policy can incentivize, as I showed with insurance, can also act as a barrier. Think about uh, prevention of building heights. Uh, then you can't elevate your building if there's, a, if there's a policy in that. But what to do really depends on the context. Uh, there's not a, 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 a silver bullet for every area. Um, but I also think we can definitely learn from other places. For instance, in the Netherlands, I strongly believe that we can learn about the flood fighting experience which they have uh, in the United States uh, and vice versa. The Netherlands is well known of you know, exporting our expertise when it comes to flood protection to other deltas in the world. So with that, I, I, I want to thank you and I'm happy to answer, answer any questions in the, in the next session. Very excellent, Hans. Thank you very much as well for providing us with your overview more on the Dutch context. Um, you please join us as well as we have about 10 minutes left for some Q&A. For all the viewers, please feel free to drop a Q&A in a question within the Q&A section. I saw one already on the model that you showed, Han. Hans. I think it was from 2008, if I was correct. So it's it's out there for a while. Yeah. Um, is it being used uh, internationally already as well by several parties, these stages? Um, would I, in, in the academic literature, it is yeah, it's definitely used as more of an umbrella. Um, I think many uh, countries, when it comes to the more implementation, the practical side, um, um, countries, they focus on the parts which are important to them. I showed the multi-layer safety as we have in the Netherlands. And that's basically the disaster management cycle, but then focus for the Netherlands for our specific situation with the parts already made a bit more concrete, which is important uh, for us. So there's, there's many frameworks, uh, and this is, let's say, the more generic overall one, but I think more locally, they are already a bit more specified. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much. Joop, also, uh, thanks again for sharing your presentation. Uh, at one stage, you were mentioning that women in Africa are being hit harder by climate change. Um, yeah, different to men in Africa. How come? Um, for various reasons, right? I mean, to give you an example, like women have mostly less access to, to financial services and insurance as compared to men. So that makes them it makes it harder for him to, to recover from a disaster event. It makes them more vulnerable. Um, if you go to poorer neighborhoods, often um, if there are toilets at all, they use uh, communal toilets. Now, when these get flooded, women are forced to go in the open and that exposes them to sexual harassment. Um, they often don't have a job or they have jobs that are paying less well than, than men. So there are many, many reasons, like often they're also excluded from certain services. They don't have equal access as compared to men. So then there are many different reasons, but what we see across the world, uh, women and young girls, adolescent girls are hit hard, are affected more by, by disaster events, be it floods or be it uh, droughts. But in case of drought, I can give you one final example. In many countries, women are the ones managing the water for the household so they're the ones fetching the water they don't mostly sometimes but mostly they don't have a tap at home they open 
they need to go and fetch water. And when I was working in India, women were spending up to four to five hours in the summer just carrying water. And you can per imagine if that per day, yeah. Wow. That, that's yeah. massive, right? And you can imagine if that happens more often, um, you get, yeah, it, it's not good for health. It's not good for your well-being. Not at all, definitely. Sticking with you, Joop Anik is asking what kind of solution does Joop see to help solve problems in Jamena? Um, so, I mean, you need to be very aware and like, is that the institutional capacity in Jamena is very limited. Um, Hans mentioned spatial planning as a part of a solution. And um, spatial planning in Jamena exists on paper. It doesn't exist in reality, right? I mean, uh, like lay zoning, telling people not to build at certain places is, is not very effective. So what we came to is basically a combination of gray and green solutions. The city is luckily very spacious. Um, so what we intend to do, what the project was likely to do is that we it will be constructing a network of retention bases connected with different can uh, canals. But in between, we also be looking for green solutions. So if a retention basin dries up, can you plan after for, for urban agriculture? Because basically it will generate uh, an income for people, makes them less vulnerable. It also will produce nutrition and that's especially important for the poor. Can you look at green corridors, for instance, like so that the city gets less hot? So these are the kind of solutions, but I think important that they're going to be compromises, like from a Dutch point of view, right? It's never going to be perfect. There. No, no. So these retention facilities, this is for storing the water, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So basically, when it rains, um, you store the water so the impact of flood gets reduced. Mm -hmm. Um, we already know it will not completely mitigate the flood, right? It, flood, places will continue to be flooded, hopefully less long and less deep. Yeah. But yeah. The chances that it will completely solve the issue is very limited. Yeah. Before we go back to Hans, one final question for you. You, uh, Piet is uh, suggesting, would it be useful is if every European country would adopt one country in Africa? That's his suggestion. Would it be useful? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's a model, right? Like um, what's important is that um, they need resources. And as I mentioned, like it does make a lot of sense to invest. Like that's what you see from the agriculture part. If you invest in dollar in climate adaptation, the economic returns are between one to $10, like, sorry, between four to $10. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, what's important, yes, you can think of a model, one country adopting another country. What's really important is these people need to have a say in their own future, right? Whether, no matter how the government is, it's mm -hmm. their future, they need to decide and they need to be in the driving seat. And any way that we can channel support to them is super welcome, but let's make sure that they are in the driving seat of their own future. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Hans, there's one question for you. Um, in the recovery phase, once you said, we try to get back to normal, but shouldn't we build back better to be prepared for changing climate circumstances? In Limburg, I heard the water boards and municipality only receive money for the immediate responses, response um, and immediate reparation of dikes, but the building back better part was supposed to be paid by themselves. Isn't that weird? Could we change that somehow? Yeah, I think uh, first up, I, I completely agree. Um, when a um, when a, when a disaster hits and we need to rebuild, it's the uh, it's the perfect opportunity window of opportunity to to build back better. Um, and it would be uh, it would be shame to 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 let that go. I think um, the um, so should we? Yes, uh, I think. And um, also, I think after. Um, uh, after Sandy in New York, I remember that there were there was federal funds for the states of New York and New Jersey, uh, and that was not just for uh, for their recovery, but that was also for for future adaptation mitigation. Um, 
we have to realize that that in in the Netherlands we already take climate change into account in our current policies in our in our standards uh, a bit um, up to 2050, if I'm correct. Um, um, should, should we pay for that? I think one reason which opponents would say, and what also insurers do, if you are insured for flooding, um, for instance, if your uh, I don't know if your TV is uh, uh, is damaged, then you get the what we call the um, and I'm trying to find the word, but you actually you do not get like if you had a TV which was a thousand euros, uh, but it was like 10 years ago, you don't get a thousand euros to buy a, a new TV because it was already an older TV. Yeah, so, it de decreased in value. Yeah, so you get the depreciated value, as they call it. I now got the word. Um, 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 and that's not building back better, of course. Um, um, but that's the that's at least how insurance usually usually function functions and, and some compensation schemes as well. Um, but I would absolutely advocate for compensation schemes where uh, where we do improve the situation. And there are examples I know from hail damage on uh, on greenhouses. Uh, I know that some insurers that they uh, they pay for stronger glass on those uh, uh, on those greenhouses uh, um, uh, in their uh, in their compensation. So there mm -hmm. are some examples, but uh, it should be more mainstream. I agree. Yeah. So maybe to finalize, actually, for the both of you, because there are some questions regarding law, but I don't know how far these or law is a scope actually of the research and the work the both of you are doing. But maybe Hans, uh, staying with you, Puthini is asking, Hans, you are talking about preventions and how, it, how to minimize the flooding risks. Can you also explain how it works with the law, by example, with Waterwet, the water law, and so on, um, specifically in the current preventions in line? Um, is the current preventions in line with the current and newest law? Do you know about this? or? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a nice question because in the Netherlands, it's actually quite unique that our prevention standards, they are put in law. Um, so at, at our government, they have to uh, provide those protection standards. And there's like a six year cycle where you know all the levies are being tested. Uh, and if some levies do not provide that protection, then they, uh, they are going to be uh, adjusted. And there's, there's the, the Delta Fund uh, uh, for that. Um, it's also an interesting question because you can do a, um, you can do a law on a certain prevention um, but you can, uh, that's only part of the disaster management cycle, right? Um, you can also say our target is a certain risk which we want to have. And in Venice, that's a bit uh, uh, combined because we have differentiated uh, protection standards depending on the risk of different areas, but also for the, uh, the danger of, of fatalities, of dying because of a flood, uh, which is a, a, a risk. Uh, there we also have a standard in the Netherlands of, uh, of one to 10 to the minus five, so one in um, 100,000. Uh, so 0.0001%. Uh, Fair enough. And then still what we've seen, and especially in Africa, you can have like everything on paper, but then reality is something different. So that's also good to know. Uh, gentlemen, it's time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much, both you coming from the floating office in Rotterdam, as well as Hans coming from Amsterdam. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing your thoughts and as well your presentations. We will divide them later on, share them, I should say, um, through email. If you are curious um, for, for more, please uh, rejoin us on May 20th. This is from 4 to 5 in the afternoon. This is Central European time. And then we will zoom in on water resilient infrastructure. Now we have the general overview and in the upcoming webinars, we will cover various topics. Do you have any ideas for an online meetup on, based on road or waterways maintenance? Please reach out because we will love to help and you can reach us through this link. This all is supported by all of our partners. You see them below in screen. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks again, yet again, Joop and both Hans. And we hope to see you next time. This was Climate Adaption and Overview. Thank you very much and have a good day.